Right. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Andrew Jones. I am the chair of the Center for Chinese Studies. And I'm delighted to welcome you all here for this afternoon's talk. Um, this talk is the sixth annual Elvera Kuang Siam Lim Memorial Lecture in Chinese Studies. This endowed lectured series was made possible through a generous gift to the Center for Chinese Studies by Mrs. Lim's family to honor her dedication to scholarly exchange. With this endowment, we bring one eminent scholar to Berkeley each fall semester to present a public lecture, meet with faculty and graduate students, and generally foster scholarly exchange and debate amongst colleagues. The namesake of this, new, of this series, uh, Elvira Kuang Xiam Lim, uh, was born in Shantou, Guangdong province in 1928. She was sent to Hong Kong to attend high school and later received her undergraduate degree from the University of Hong Kong. After receiving her PhD from the University of Hawaii, Mrs. Lim took a position in the biology department of the newly established Chinese University of Hong Kong, where she remained until her retirement in 1989. She passed away in Oakland, California on March 27, 2006. In addition to this lecture series, Mrs. Lim's family established an endowed graduate fellowship competition in her name to reward academic excellence in Chinese studies and further bolster the growing community of China scholars across campus that the Center for Chinese Studies is here to serve. So with that introduction, I'd also, of course, like to introduce today's speaker, um, who is Professor Lynn White, um, Emeritus Professor of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University, as well as a senior research scholar at the Woodrow Wilson School, also at Princeton. Um, and I understand that Professor White's uh, talk tonight is also something of a homecoming. He's a, a, a Californian, as well as a product of Berkeley and Chinese studies at Berkeley, um, who was a habitué of the Center for Chinese Studies um, when it was still on Shaddock Avenue. Um, it's moved since. Um, so it's wonderful to have Professor White here. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, he is one of the most eminent scholars of Chinese political science. Um, who's also produced a great many very um, wonderful uh, scholars uh, as, as a teacher and a mentor and pedagogue. So that's also a wonderful facet of his work. His interests include comparative revolutions and reforms and comparative organization. He's the author of a number of books, um, including Unstately Power, colon, Local Causes of, Chinese, of China's Reforms, um, Policies of Chaos, and Careers in Shanghai. He's also published articles in many different journals. I won't recite them all here, um, but they include uh, the American Political Science Review, China Quarterly, the Journal of Asian Studies, Modern China, and others. And he's currently working on a comparison of elections in several East Asian countries on the effects of globalization in Taiwan and on US perceptions of Chinese reform, and of course, on the material that he'll be speaking to us about um, this afternoon. Um, once Professor White has finished his presentation, we will also have a discussant, a respondent, um, and our respondent for tonight is Professor Bolanzhi, um, who is also working on the urbanization process in rural China. So there are a lot of points of resonance between uh, the paper tonight from Professor White and the work that Professor Bo has been engaged in as well. So we're looking forward to that conversation and, of course, to welcoming Professor White. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. I was not only an habitué of the Center for Chinese Studies, I was a supportee of the center, uh, which was very generous to me uh, many years ago in, the, in uh, uh, Berkeley here. It is a great pleasure to be back uh, to UC. Uh, Barbara Sue, my wife, and I, uh, she's there, uh, are back um, uh, and at a, a place at Euclid Avenue, at least for winters. It is an honor to give the Lim Lecture. Elvira Lim wanted to foster scholarly exchange, uh, as Andrew Jones has just said, and I want to make contacts again uh, with faculty and students at the Center for Chinese Studies. Uh, Eleanor Levine is already planning some meetings for January, 
Uh, and I'm impressed by the number of events that you have here. Not only presidential debates tonight, and I thank you all for coming uh, despite the uh, schedule problem there, but my friend uh, Leo Sida is giving a talk this Friday on legal affairs. You have a weekend grad graduate student uh, conference um, coming up. There are just lots of talks, so I thank you for coming to this one. Uh, I was a grad student in the 1960s, learning from Chalmers Johnson, Bob Scalapino, Franz Schurman, Joseph Levinson, Fred Wakeman, Ji Wen Chun, Wolfram Eberhard, Jack Potter, Edwin Ch uh, Edward Schaefer. It was quite a china shop at that time. Uh, each is a revered Lauscher, and their influence will be evident in this talk. I am interested, as Johnson was, in the political factors of economic growth, as Schurman was in the roles of medial leaders and centralization to mid-levels, as Bob Scalapino was, and Johnson too, in trying to be a passably full Asianist. China Southeast Asia and China Northeast Asia comparisons are key, I think, to understanding what happens in China and in those other countries. Perhaps the main contemporary Chinese questions are, why has this country grown so fast economically, and what are the political factors and results of that growth? But to answer those present and recent questions, I'm going to ask you to reach back in time. My emphasis in this talk is not screamingly up to date. Uh, it is 1966 to, to about uh, 1990 or 1989, a period I call early reforms, uh, when the basis was set for China's later changes. Let me offer a precy of the general ideas first. The beginning of the end of China's political revolution and the start of economics reform, uh, economic reforms was, I think, rural industry. Field mechanization in the late 1960s and early 1970s spread technologies that local leaders used to establish or restart rural factories in their own lead networks. These are often called social networks, but one of the emphases in the talk is that they were really political networks, not part of the state, or at least not controlled by the government. These local leaders and their factories took law, raw materials that had previously gone to urban state industries. By the mid-1980s, this weakened Beijing's revolutionary state by ending most planning. By the early 1990s, period really after my main emphasis here, leaders of the larger policy, a polity, somewhat restored their authority after they came to terms with markets that they could not control. To repeat the argument in other terms, the Green Revolution after 1965, near Shanghai, for example, required machines which created local political justifications for small and medium enterprises, factories. This made local wealth and prestige for the reformist local leaders who fostered it. Let me see. Yeah, this um, but not for socialist conservatives uh, who are some called radicals or sometimes miscalled leftists, who exist at, existed and still coexist with reformers at all sizes of China's polity. Uh, Bo Xilai, incidentally, was an example of one of these socialist conservatives, I believe. The Yangtze Delta enjoyed a spectacular quick rise of rural industrial product in the early 1970s. I'm about to present some statistics on that long before reforms were announced in Beijing in 1978. And even when the reforms were announced, socialist conservatives at all sizes of polity tried to undermine the reforms. I avoid the word levels. I'm using the words sizes of polity because the word levels imply that high levels are always powerful and lower levels, almost by definition, are less so. But behaviorally, that isn't always the case. In fact, the main things I'm talking about are situations in which that is not the case. I want to talk about polities that are of all sizes, including very small ones, even families, in which power, by any objective definition, is exercised. Also, networks of entrepreneurs. 
And also, I want to talk about many medial sizes of polities. The term central and local are often used in Chinese studies. But China is so big. There are many med medial levels that need much more attention. This is a point that Schurman uh, brought out, I think, particularly clearly. Socialist conservatives, conservatives who wanted to maintain planning in the socialist systems, saw that rural companies would end most planning because rural factories took raw materials from the state sector and took markets to which the state factories had sold. The result by the mid-1980s for socialism was that planning was reduced. Inflation went out of control, and the state, at high administrative levels, had less money. There were political results, too, of which Tiananmen 1989 is most famous, but another later political result was the Zhurongji era, uh, regenerating the Chinese Leviathan uh, as Yang Dali, uh, my friend and former student and former colleague of Bill Parish at Chicago, who's sitting back there, uh, has said, uh, Jews reform remade a control freaky state so that it could get along with markets that are inherently hard to control for any government. That's the skinny of the argument. Details, too many statistics, I apologize, are in the notes that I posted online along with footnotes uh, to the sources. Uh, and I'm pleased that my uh, commentator, uh, Professor Bo, is, I think, the only person who actually has printed out the rather long thing that was posted online, which is not a paper, it is notes. The Green Revolution of the late 1960s in rich rural areas has received scant attention because it coincided in time with the Cultural Revolution in urban areas that affected intellectuals, who, unlike farmers, write history and are very good at complaining. I remember when I took uh, the Chinese history course from Joseph Levinson here at Berkeley many years ago, the main question on the final exam was, what does the fact that intellectuals write history uh, mean for our understanding of Chinese history? A nice question from an intellectual historian and not an easy one to answer. Agricultural extension in the late 1960s 60s involved more walking tractors and rice transplanting machines, new seeds for rice that put more of the sun's energy into growing edible grain rather than in making the stalks taller. Short stalk rice yielded more calories per mo, but it required more inorganic fertilizer and more reliable water regulated by canals during dry spells and by tube wells in soggy seasons. But all of that, the fertilizer, the pumps, the canals, meant that more capital was needed, as well as more labor. The advertisement for this talk pictured a walking tractor, the stalking horse of reforms. Shanghai's extensive suburban fields in 1965 uh, were 17% machine tilled. By 1972, the portion was already 76%. By 1984, 89%. This was explosive growth of the new agronomy in the late 1960s in an atypically rich area of China, but typical of the Yangtze Delta. This green revolution is practically ignored by Chinese and Western academics because it had essentially nothing to do with Mao, with his radical and interesting wife, with Zhou, or with Deng, all those top leaders about whom we rightly love to complain or praise. Local leaders of essentially non-state networks, or networks the government could not control, even when it wanted to, and it did want to, in rich areas, could set up factories, usually in brigade or team collectives at that time, at first using local labor, not just to soften the employment effects of the new machines on the fields, but mainly to take advantage of new financial resources that factories generated. What these factories made was not very fancy, making cement, bricks, pumps, glass, cigarettes, other easily saleable products did not need high technology. Quick rural industrialization, which was allowed but not planned by the multi-tier party regime, meant that state enterprises could no longer commandeer raw materials to which they'd become accustomed at prices they were able to pay. This reform syndrome, as I want to call it, was rooted in locally led change. Part of the talk is a criticism of 
most political science. Political science, if it's really behavioral, is about power, is about power exercised in any kind of network. Families, local networks, not just the government. Until political scientists begin to look more beyond the government, as for example E.E. E. Schottschneider did, um, I think we don't understand the most important loci of politics. Reforms had many aspects, some good and some bad. Economic boom, that's good. Shortages. Inflation. Bribes for the procurement agents mainly. Government budget deficits. Less state control over migrants. More freedom for migrants. Popular satisfaction with new prosperity. So more party legitimacy from that source, economic development, and somewhat stronger courts of law, though not yet rule of law. Social pluralization, more interests in society, able to make more demands on government in the way Sam Huntington feared. Shanghai had large rural areas, and the whole Yangtze Delta is really my topic here, in southern Jiangsu and northern Zhejiang and the Shanghai, sub Shanghai rural areas. I think similar processes also began in the Pearl River Delta, perhaps a little later. This needs much more work. Uh, and later, near Shantou and Xiaoman, uh, Elvira Lim's turf, uh, Fuzhou, and the Chengdu Plain, and a little bit of work has been done on that, which soon became the re realm of reformer Zhao Ziyang. Much more research is needed on the timings in those places. Others, such as Wenzhou, clearly came later. But reforms spread inland, above all, from the area around Shanghai, from southern uh, Jiangsu and northern Zhejiang. Uh, and they began in these traditionally rich rural areas, not in the highly taxed central cities, and also not in poor rural areas. The change was, as Mary Gallagher has argued, a contagious capitalism. At least in Jiangnan, in the Delta, Early reforms should be periodized from 1971 to 1989. The reforms started not from China's top leadership, not from Mao or the historical accident of one man's death in 1976, but from parallel motives in far larger groups, far larger networks, I should say, of medial and local leaders of more than a billion people, not just one leader or five or seven or nine in Beijing but many, many more. But it was political. It was led. The new agronomy was not the only factor leading to reforms. I would argue that it was the most important one, but there were others too. Passive allowance by some top leaders, despite opposition from others, was a factor. Two additional ones were also important. First, media leaders could act more independently by 1970-71 because the staffs of town offices that had previously monitored rural areas were decimated during the Cultural Revolution. Second, or third or fourth uh, reason after the ones I've listed, of uh, these media leaders had earlier during the Great Leap Forward been the party's tools in a decentralization to middle levels that Schurman described in a book that was published as he chaired this Center for Chinese Studies. Memories of the 1959-61 famines and shortages justified media leaders making decisions in tacit neglect of orders from higher levels, as Yang Dali, among others, argue. But the biggest factor allowing local political decisions for reform lay in machine tools that saved labor during China's Green Revolution and the chance to develop rural factories that captured the profits of manufacturing. Transplanting machines to pluck rice seedlings from nursery, uh, nursery plots and then plant them into the big fields, big paddies. Walking tractors to aerate soil, pull a plowshare or thresher or reaper. The engines of these tractors that could be hitched to pumps optimizing the level of water along with the level, the height of rice as it's growing in a paddy. These machines could also haul tractors, taking crop to market. Machine power replaced hand power, human power, a classic index of modernization. The total wattage of all agricultural machinery in Shanghai's rural areas, the total wattage rose 19% annually 
from 1965 to 78, compounded, that is a very high rate, that is explosive growth, compounded for 13 years, all before reforms were announced in Beijing. From 1979 to 89, the annual increase in watts used by in the same area was lower, actually, less than 3% as compared to 19% increase per year from 65 to 78. Oh, it's a footnote. Uh, cadres for career reasons may uh, uh, file statistics that were lies, the famous lies, damn lies, and statistics problem. But the numbers I use are only about very dramatic changes. Many other numbers, I think, uh, are difficult to use. Uh, and one has to face the question, why would leaders, uh, local leaders, have lied more in the later years than in the earlier ones, if one wants to... Uh, you know, a question the statistics. It's really the direction of the statistics that moves me mostly. Ownership was already changing, too, in both agriculture and industry. In 1975, in Shanghai's rural counties, 51% of all means of production already belonged to the lowest level units, production teams. 34% were, were in communes. Gang of four member Zhang Chungqiao, then in charge of Shanghai, thought the commune portion low and the team portion much too high. He fulminated that rural factories would weaken socialism. They were sprouts of capitalism in the countryside. He was absolutely right about that. Go to the Chinese countryside now and see. There is a lot of capitalism floating around there. Uh, local leaders, he was right, but local leaders trumped him. He was technically in charge. He wasn't in charge. The local level was strong, the higher level was weak. What does lower mean? What does higher mean? Reforms at this time had begun slowly, also in other fields too, ranging from foreign policy and military budgets, local media, even art. Ellen Lang and Julia Andrews and some other, Joan Cohen have written books about that. Music, perhaps. I gather that uh, uh, Andrews' next project uh, will deal with the early 70s uh, music in China. Totally new thing. Also, the 1973 reappearance of Deng Xiaoping. Has that nothing to do with reforms? So did reforms begin only in 1978? It is no longer adequate to say they did. It also hides far too much to claim that the cult Cultural Revolution ended as late as 1976. 1966 to 76 was not a uniform era, and the early 70s in particular needs much more research. This is the least well understood half decade of PRC history in almost all its aspects. The usual emphases, emphases on 76 and 78 clearly relate to the interests of high leaders who together hope everyone imagines that they, only they, can bring all benefits that any Chinese ever enjoy. This is ideological and has an ideological purpose, but it is not true. More important, it prejudges the question of whether changes can be led by units outside Beijing and by small units. But the national government liked green revolution just fine because the extra grain could be taxed. The standard classic grain tax. Even radicals liked tripl triple cropping, much though they disliked rural mechanization that led to rural factories. And triple cropping was mainly new in the period that I'm talking about. As late as 1959 in Suzhou Prefecture, very rich Jiangnan area, many fields were still just single cropped in 59. Still, double cropping is also an old pro practice, uh, as is alternation of crops, of course. By 1965, only 2% of arable land in Shanghai was, tr was triple cropped. But by 1971, three quarters were triple cropped, a very fast rise. By 1974, of the two-thirds of Shanghai land that were used in any season for grain, 83% were triple cropped. This created problems for farmers. If crops are harvested three rather than two times a year, output value rises just 40% rather than the 50% that the two to three ratio would imply. And triple cropping raises income to farmers by an average of only 16%, even though much more than 16% additional labor and capital is needed. Three crops require paying much more for fertilizers Output is somewhat higher, but the work is much harder. 
three, har three harvests and the extra tax were not feasible without machines and without the active consent of local farmer leaders. The only way for government to get this consent was to let these leaders develop the machine shops and expand them into rural factories. As a saying went, better a little factory than a ton of grain to the mow. Rural leaders still spoke and no doubt thought very well of the state. They weren't anti-state. They were proud to be state cadres. But they weakened a large policy when they strengthened their own polities. When peasant leaders obeyed the state, they could fail as synaptic or hinge leaders serving their own local constituents. But also, rural leaders were at no time in consistent agreement with each other. Some were reformists, others were conservative. Decollectivization was opposed by some local, medial, and high leaders. Xu Jiatun was a high administrator in Jiangsu province, sitting in Nanjing, during the early 1970s. Uh, he was also the highest leader to leave China after June 4, 1989. And writing from the safety of a Buddhist monastery here in California, Xu, uh, Xu evinced pride in Jiangsu's progress during the early 1970s. Quote, I tell you, we took a different road from the rest of the country. The official line was, the planned economy was crucial and the market economy was a supplement. We had openly to support this, but in fact, we had gone beyond it. Xu and his reformist comrades simply blinked at local changes from the vantage point of their province level office, very high level office in Nanjing. Zhang Chunqiao in Shanghai was not willing to blink. Zhang's shrill complaints were generally deemed in the West at the time to be what any devoted leftist, actually a conservative to preserve socialism, would have said reflexively with or without evidence, but these local industries were a threat to socialist centralism. Officials in all layers of the Chinese state had disagreements about this, and they still do, not just through the 1970s, but through the 1980s and really up to the present. One honest, very high official admitted that his level did not make most reforms. Uh, he was Deng Xiaoping, who confessed his astonishment. And let me quote here from Deng, uh, speaking to a group of Yugoslav journalists, interestingly. Generally speaking, our rural reforms, this is Deng talking, our rural reforms have proceeded very fast, and farmers have been enthusiastic. What took us by surprise completely was the development of township and village industries. This is not the achievement of our central government. Every year, township and village industries achieve 20% growth. Actually, that's a slight underestimate in comparison with some of the places I'm looking at. This was not something, says Dung, I had thought about, nor had the other comrades. This surprised us, unquote from Dung. Is Dung authoritative enough to say uh, who didn't start reforms? As late as December 1978, the third plenum of the 11th Party Congress passed a resolution that specified that contracting to households should be illegal. It said other things, too, that were in some contradiction with that. But if 1978 be taken as the crucial watershed toward reforms, this was a very odd way to begin them. Conservatives in the state doggedly tried to retain a unified purchasing policy, which in Mao's time had allowed huge extractions from the countryside to cities. When the state price was good, peasants willingly sold, but the government had to offer increasingly price incentives to get grain for its urban employees and inputs for its urban factories. This ruined the official budgets. The term reforms, the word reforms, gets used in two different ways. It can mean a set of policies in agriculture, industry, foreign affairs, art, law, all sorts of fields, but it is also used separately refer to refer to a time period in which reformers at all sizes of polity advocated flexibility to adapt their elite, that these were reformers in the party overwhelmingly, uh, while conservatives at all sizes of polity advocated diametrically opposite policies to maintain party integrity and stability. The word reforms can refer to a set of policies or it can refer to a time period. And 
Uh, I just think that that should be made clear. The, the circulation of elites' views, a view of people who wanted to advocate flexibility or those who wanted to advocate stability, Hu Jintao's favorite word, or uh, the integrity of the party, um, were and still are in opposition to each other. I apologize for even suggesting here in Berkeley that the reactionary Count Pareto, um, uh, who gave, uh, who started the circulation of elites theory, uh, might have any virtue to him. He was very bright, not just conservative. Uh, there are many things to say about him, but I won't go into it. Uh, local hinge leaders, agents and victims of the state, as Helen Chu says, increasingly had options to respond more to their network's opportunities or, alternatively, to mandates coming down in the party. I look at this in different parts of rural East China, especially in uh, suburban Shanghai, from which the evidences are, are quite full, uh, mainly in gazetteers, county gazetteers, places, sources like that, and local newspapers. I compare Chuansha, River Sand County, Chuansha County, with other Shanghai counties, such, such as Songjiang, which has been much studied by many people. Uh, there are contrasts, not just in this era, between sandy soil, cotton growing places like Chuansha, which is now called Pudong, and carbon soil, rice growing places, not cotton growing, like Songjiang, the cotton places tended to be more reformist earlier. The rice places more obedient, more Tinghua. By 1970, even though Songjiang County was then richer, just 46% of Songjiang output value was industrial. But by 1975, five years later, the Songjiang figure was up to 61%, not yet, uh, not up to Chuan Cha's level, level, which was 74%, where the local cadres were more reformist. These two large counties switched places in comparative wealth between 1970 and 1975. It is possible to make similar comparisons within counties of different communes or brigades or villages. The personal career motivations of local leaders of these small units made big differences for relative prosperity or relative stagnancy. In 1966, the very, uh, early, the variance between rich and poor brigades in rural Shanghai was still not great. Among 20 production brigades, a more taxed group of 10 delivered about the same grain per capita as a less taxed group of 10 brigades, 50, 556 jin per worker rather than 580. But by 1978, the per capita deliveries from the 10 richer brigades had risen more than three quarters to 960 gene, while deliveries from the poor ones had fallen by one quarter to 470 gene per worker. The higher delivery brigades did not grow all the grain they paid in tax. They bought it with industrial profits. Rural local leaders, conservatism or reformism could vary even when their places' ecologies were very similar. Uh, talking about two brigades, uh, Deng Yi and Shanhuang brigades, both in Chuansha County, uh, had nearly identical incomes in 1966, but by 1978, Deng Yi's income doubled and Shanhuang's rose more than 10 times. That's a big difference. Shanhuang's local leaders were more willing to run the early 1970s risks of nurturing sprouts of capitalism, while Deng Yi's cadres avoided this political risk. Pre-78 reforms showed a common pattern, a major boom in the early 1970s, in the, really throughout the Yangtze Delta, a period of less change in most places after 1976, resurgence after 1978, but often not to the level that the early 70s, 71 to 75 showed, and another slowing in 1984-85. There are all sorts of effects of this. Let me mention one. Men shifted from, from farm work more than women did. As a newspaper said, uh, and my wife is to close her ears and not to listen to this part, uh, the question who should be growing crops is far less worrisome than the fact that men are not willing to do it. Local men got their wives and daughters to grow enough so that local leaders would not get criticism from party bosses. 
But the best gambit locally, not nationally, but locally, was to buy grain with factory profits, pay whatever the top cadres wanted uh, with that bought grain, so that nobody in the family or the village would have to grow it. Processing raw materials is practically always more profitable than extracting them. The Young Tea Delta has industries, has had industries for centuries, silk weaving, ceramics, other industries. Industry's portion of all Jiangsu rural output was 13% in 1970, up to 40% in 1976. And most of this was in Sunan, if uh, Jiangsu, as you know, has two quite different parts. And if you uh, take out the, nor uh, the northern half of the thing, then you get much higher than 40% of the industri industrial portion of a rural output value. Brigade and commune enterprises later became cooperatives run by townships, and still later, often, they became private firms, stolen from the state by their cadres, in effect. Statistics from more local booming places tell the, table, tell, tell the tale even more dramatically. Industry's portion of gross output value in a place called rural Tangjiaotsun, in Qingtsun commune, was only 7%. Industrial portion of rural output value in this place was 7% in 1970. By 1971, it was 11%, 22% in 72, 44% in 73, 59% by 74. And a Japanese anthropologist, the Japanese have done rather better studies of this than people writing in English, um, said that this place was typical of the area. This wasn't exceptional. In 72, a plastics plant at this place and a silk villager were founded in Qingtsun. Uh, these were the first local industries there not creating prod products that were used within the community, such as uh, fertilizer or simple household goods. They made things for sale elsewhere in China, not yet for export abroad. That came later, not so long later, uh, but the, it began as a domestic uh, matter. A place called Tangqiao Commune, Suzhou Prefecture, again in the heart of this very rich East China area, traditionally rich, had some firms founded during the Great Leap Forward, but most were started in the first half of the 1970s. 1971, a power plant, a cardboard box factory, metal shops, an animal feed factory. And in 72, one of the brigades in this um, commune founded a brick factory that proved to be extremely profitable. So by 73, that brigade's industries made it the rich in, richest in the commune. Word of success spreads very quickly in rural China. By 1974, Tang Chao leaders set up an industrial office. A writer said that these, com that these commune cadres, quote, ran a certain political risk, unquote, as no doubt they did. But they weren't caring about it. They were responding to their own constituents, not to the higher levels of the party. Villages found that the more they invested in agriculture, the less money they made. So much for studying Dajai. State leaders did not bring this change. Local leaders did. And I don't just mean people. I'm not, not just talking about bottom-up in a very general sense. I'm talking about local and medial leaders who did this. This was political. It wasn't just economic. The number of factories at Tangchao, this place, doubled from 76 to 78. They sent a comprehensive sales team to tour more than 10 provinces and establish 90 sales points in various Chinese cities. So industry moved very seamlessly into commerce, selling the products of the new factories. Migrants from outside were 22% of the workers in the village run, low level administrated, or I shouldn't say that, small polity administrated uh, factories, but less than that, 14%. Migrants from outside were 14% only in factories run by the larger polities. Fei Xiaotong, China's most famous sociologist, anthropologist, admits many factories in South China were secret. Of course, he studies this part of the country, especially. And let me quote him. In the later stages of the Cultural Revolution, uh, he means the early 1970s, but he's still called the later stages of the Cultural Revolution, many small enterprises emerged in Sunan, southern Jiangsu, these firms established by local cadres were illegal. He uses that word. They were underground. 
Because of the Cultural Revolution, higher level cadres had no time to deal with such things, so more and more enterprises emerged. Peasants did not mind what the nature of ownership was. The only thing they did mind was to keep up their livelihood. Capital came from collective accumulation, not from the state banks. Uh, that's my addition. The government, says Faye, did not give money or invest. Actually, every commune and every village was an economic enterprise. Big collectives were still managed by local governments. There was no separation between enterprises and local governments." Unquote from Fay. Even if bribes and imposts on firms remained as great under collective as under state ownership, funds taken from collectives tended to remain local. Factory heads stood a greater chance of influencing the later use of such money if more of it stayed in town. Collectives flourished better than formerly private firms. There are a number of people who have written about that, including some in this room. They might be dependent firms, guahu, of a state enterprise using that firm's red chops and bank accounts or permissions, but the authority of a collective's director was just as full as that of any private tycoon. Rural state industries, rural quote state industries, were often leased to their managers. Labor was tightly controlled by those managers. By the mid-1980s, less than half of suburban workers had registered households, even though some had temporary permits of often colloquially called lanka, of blue cards. I think Tom Gold is among the people who's written about this. Many people have. Exploitation of workers in some Jiangnan rural factories was brutal. Let me take a particularly brutal example. In Zhangnan County, Zhejiang, there was a survey of 284 rural factories which found sweatshops with 500 child laborers between the ages of 10 and 16, average age 13.6 years. Girls were 83% of the total in these factories. Many of these young women, very, really, girls, came from nearby villages. Not yet were all the migrants from far inland. Just one-fifth of them had finished second grade. They worked from 8 to 11 hours on peace rates, earning 1.2 to 3 yuan per day, in other words, subsistence wage. They were in unventilated plastic shops using chemicals that are dangerous to health. But rural factories were the most dynamic part of China's economy. These firms were often inefficient in technical terms. Their decision structures were tyrannical. They were not democratic. They were uncivil. As Mae West might have said, uh, civil society had nothing to do with it. But they flourished, and they outstripped the state sector at the same time, re-legitimating the Communist Party after famine and cultural revolution. They supplied new jobs, and their products made people happier in general when sold all over the country. They also ruined socialism in most sectors. In an attempt to guarantee planned deliveries of materials to state factories, the government had to legalize a black market. It let state factories sell inputs at 20% above state fixed prices, after those firms claimed to have filled their production quotas. So, Shanghai's free market price of coal in 1988 was 220% of the fixed state prices. Big increase above the fixed state price. For electricity, 176%. For steel, 160%. For aluminum, 250%. And for timber, 550%. Timber's very short. New rural industries could afford to buy inputs from state factories. They were more nimble, they were more exploitative of labor, and they had better profit margins. Um, they could afford to buy inputs from state factories that had got these inputs at low state prices. They spent so much buying raw materials and energy, the national state companies got an amount equal at least to 6% of all revenues at all levels of government in China as pure profit from speculative exchanges in materials that the state had given them cheaply. Rural enterprises won uh, wars for materials. They won against state factories. These were known as the tobacco war, the wool war, and so forth. 
the portion of all Shanghai factory inputs by value allocated by plan plummeted from 70% to 20% in the mid-1980s. Planners could not enforce the deliveries of goods. The number of products from Shanghai State Factory under mandatory production quotas dropped from 150 in 1984 to 37 by 1987. As a sardonic pair of Shanghai journalists observed, and I quote them, developing the commodity economy without commodities is a major vexation for enterprises in Shanghai. By the mid-1980s, many small companies in China were totally unregistered. According to a German scholar, quote, a non-licensed individual economy existed which was just as large as the licensed. Small and rural enterprises were aware, very aware, of the state corporation in their own fields, making products uh, such as they made. Now, that does not include oil or st uh, steel, capital uh, uh, products that require huge capital investment or major point sources like oil of the, of the resource, but it does include most commodities. And the small and rural enterprises were well aware of the state corporations in their field. In a survey, 48% of these entrepreneurs in China said they were, quote, in competition, unquote, with state factories. They were winning, and plans no longer could restrain, restrain them. So, contracts replace plans became a slogan. More rule of contract law sounds modern. I see Stanley Lubman, who knows more about this kind of topic than I do, sitting back there. But the contracts were no more enforceable than the plans had been. If a rural unit failed to deliver to an urban factory a contracted amount at the contracted price, the factory could sue. Even if it won the decision in an urban court, the judge there was not appointed by the same party department as were judges and police in the rural place, which might or might well not enforce the judicial decision. So, of all economic suits filed in Shanghai courts during October 1988, half were classed by the judges as, quote, unresolvable, unquote, even before they were heard or heard at any length. The reasons were rural enterprises that claimed to have closed well, often they hadn't really, but they claimed to have changed their name. Or managers who had absconded, Shalu uh, Buming. But also, courts were in the long run strengthened by market disputes. Will the economic dynamism that China has shown in local places translate later into more rule of law and into political demands that lead to a Chinese democracy or somewhat more liberal system? Uh, actually, I think it will, uh, but we might get some rich, corrupt demagogues legitimated by elections before that. I want to uh, end the China section and go on to talk about some comparative cases in Asia very quickly. Um, uh, but what leads into this is ideas about Chinese democracies. I think Westerners tend to neglect the extent to which money undermines, in all democracies, rule by the people. Uh, Westerners tend to overestimate what mass elections would do for the people in China, at least any time soon, because votes could be bought there, too. And this makes me think, right, very quickly, of Thailand and the Philippines uh, and Taiwan in the past, not currently. Uh, and also, we've reached pretty much the end of the 1980s. Now, China, of course, has a history after the end of the 80s, and it was, it, it's a fascinating and, and wonderful one. I do think that the basis of that history was set in the 1966, I go back that far, to 1989 period that I particularly emphasize in this talk. But let me end it with some comparisons Oh, just before conclusion, with some comparisons among countries that throw light on each of them. And here also I'm trying to follow the Scalapino and, Johnston, and Johnson traditions of trying to look comparatively at different Asian countries and work with material uh, from more than one of them uh, because they throw light on each other. So let me quickly go over some similarities between China and other Asian places to show more about Chinese development and change in those places and to use the same paradigm 
about industrial development by local, rural, non-governmental, or not controlled by the government, leaders. I begin with Taiwan, and not just because my discussant, uh, Professor Bo, is from there, but because agrarian reforms became the basis, I think, for Guomindang legitimacy on an island where mainlanders were a small minor minority, just 14% in the early period of economic growth. Over 99% of all agriculturalists, tenants or landlords on that island uh, were Taiwanese. I see Rosie Shea sitting over there, who is Taiwanese. Um, after the February 1947 Kuomintang violence against Taiwanese, the regime passed land laws in 1949, 51, and 53. By 53, all tenanted holdings over 8.4 acres of medium grade paddy were purchased by the government and sold to tenants at the same price. Hakkas and poor Taiwanese benefited first. The KMT needed support constituencies at this time. Land reform was a way to begin to get some of that support. The previous landowners were paid seven-tenths in bonds and three-tenths in industrial stocks from companies that had been taken over by the Guomindang from the Japanese colonialists. This lifted this, this uh, gift, really, of industrial stocks to former landowners, uh, lifted some leading rural families into industry and commerce. It gave Taiwanese clans leadership, leadership in non-state enterprises, a political role, but not in the state, perhaps delaying ambitions for leadership in government. Short stalk rice was introduced in Taiwan, but these other changes were earlier before that. Soon agriculture supplied no more than a tenth of all villagers' income on the island. In the mid-1950s, Taiwan also passed industrial laws that were, under, uh, that were unprecedented under any previous Chinese government. They allowed entrepreneurs to set up new businesses quite easily, fairly easily. Of course, there were complaints about that, but uh, in comparison with the mainland, it was very easy. And, and with all previous Chinese governments, an old tradition had been um, the shangban, uh, the officials uh, oversee and the, uh, the merchants uh, merely, uh, merely act. The, and this was a very statist view of the way economies ought to put together. The Chiang Kai-shek regime, because of its need for more support from more Taiwanese, via, uh, changed that in their industrial laws of the mid-50s. The rural Taiwanese elites, most of the leaders of most of the islanders, were industrialized by these sequels to land reform. Manufacturing on the island from 1956 to 66 grew 7.2% annually in rural areas, but just 5.3% in urban areas, faster in the rural areas manufacturing. Taiwan's total real annual uh, GNP growth through the 1960s was a very high 9.4%, accurately reported. The Gini ratio showed more equality, even as per capita income rose. So Taiwan, very unusually, uh, violated the Kuznets pattern that fast growth usually means stratification. It didn't in Taiwan. The reason wasn't that the poorest people prospered, but that small and medium enterprises did, a lot of them. These SMEs got capital mostly from each other, not from the banks, which were all state controlled. The state did not embed itself, to use a common word, in these firms, and they did not get into bed with it. As Susan Greenhall and some others have argued, the relationship was confrontational. This is not Chal Johnson's meaty story, as I think he eventually recognized. Tigers are not all identical. Uh, the Korean story is also much more like Japanese story than like the Taiwanese one. Taiwanese entrepreneurs wanted to be their own bosses. Compare this motivation with a survey that was taken on the mainland in 1997, in which two-fifths of private mainland entrepreneurs cited, quote, realizing one's own worth as the main reason they left the state system. This is a local political explanation about leadership, about local politics outside the government, where most political scientists tend to ignore power. Now, please allow a very quick trip to Thailand. 
Thai agronomy is special. Monsoon rains provide plenty of water four months each of each year. I mean, if floods don't deluge everything as they did last year, long stalk rice, not the short stalk high yield rice, but long stalk rice grows extremely well. And above all, fragrant Thai rice is an international brand name. It fetches very good prices all over Asia and elsewhere too. The Thai government more laid back than those in other Asian countries, it has not pressed for a green revolution, so Thai farmers have had mechanization, indeed, to save their labor, but not sh for short stalk varieties of rice, which have been on less than 5% of Thai paddy. A Premier Anand once said, Thailand is, quote, laissez-faire by accident. The state, when it did become dirigist in Thailand, has been extraordinarily inept imposing an export tax on rice. Oh, think of this as policy. Rice, the most reliable earner of foreign exchange, the basis for far more jobs than any other commodity. Is that what you want to have an export tax on? Discourage production. But as the economist uh, Siamala, Amar Siamala, Thai economist wrote, quote, the strength of the country's comparative advantage in agriculture, rice, was such that no amount of mismanagement by the government was sufficient to kill its competitiveness in world markets. I love this, economists wanting to measure amounts of mismanagement. It's brilliant. Uh, Thai SMEs, small and medium enterprises, and the fastest Thai growth were not mainly in Bangkok, but around big cities, as in China. Bangkok's per capita annual real growth in the early 1970s was just 1%, but 6% in Thailand's six provinces with the next highest per capita incomes. Bangkok does have the highest income, but not the highest rate of growth. 4% in the next group of seven provinces by income, and lower in the traditionally poor provinces, a pattern just like China's. This peri-urban, not urban prosperity is striking because the Thai government did practically nothing to finance it. As Parichart wrote of the growth era before 97, quote, small and medium entrepreneurs have had to be self-reliant, relatively neglected, as they were by state authorities. But Thailand had double-digit growth per capita in each year, 76 to 81, and had the world's quickest economic expansion, surpassing that of China, between 1984 and 94. Thailand's, in Thailand's boom, a German economist said SMEs were, quote, major competitors of firms in the more formal sector. Again, a bit like China, though Thailand is not a socialist country. Small city traders descended from China pillow and mat capitalists. That is a phrase that the Thai economist Pasuk Pongpachit uh, uses. I like it pillow and mat capitalists, made Thailand pro prosper. These were Chinese ties, Chinese descended ties on the paternal sides. The 1997 financial crisis hurt Thailand, of course, but its earlier boom created path-dependent institutions of entrepreneurship that were sustained. And the Thai economic record in the new millennium has kept it firmly in the tiger list of t economic tigers. But it was unlike the Japanese one that Johnson described in his meaty book, Danny Unger, another of Johnston, John, Chal Johnson's students here at Berkeley, but a Southeast Asianist, argues that, quote, Thailand's success rested on an absence of effective sectoral policies, as well as the specific assets of Thai Chinese, whose social networks, uh, he calls them social, I would call them local political, whose social networks enabled them to overcome market failures and the absence of effective market institutions. In other words, they succeeded despite that because of social capital, or political capital, you might call it. Chow eventually agreed with his student, Danny Unger, uh, for Thailand, not for Japan. Now, hop a very quick boat, finally, to the Philippines. I argue, in general, that growth occurs only if effective dominant elites want it. Those elites can be national, as in the Japanese, or mostly, I think, the Korean case. They can be local, as in the China case, and in the Taiwan case, because of Guomindang needs, in the 50s especially, and in the Thai case, because of government indolence. But non-growth is just as much led politically in local polities as growth is. 
In the Philippines, local leaders are economically crucial, but they are so able to remain dominant on their turfs, they positively hinder rather than help growth. This I propose as an answer to the perennial Philippine puzzle, which is why among the countries of East Asia do we sit decade after decade twiddling our thumbs seeing all the other East Asian economies prosper. In 1959, the Taiwan GNP per capita was lower than that of the Philippines. Uh, and the Philippines do, remains poor thus far. I'm not saying that's forever. The answer gets missed in any analysis of the nation, the Philippine nation as a whole. Zoom in more to see what's happening in the localities where most Filipinos live. That doesn't mean Metro Manila. It does mean the places where most of the Filipinos live. Local leaders keep out their entrepreneurial rivals. And for existential self-identification reasons, called by some Filipinos Hidalgo attitudes, local leaders avoid managing new industries themselves. They don't stoop to that. They have some money. They don't invest it in the places they control. They run about 150 private armies. They organize voting blocks to elect traditional politicians, a colloquial called trapos. Trapo is the Tagalog word for a dirty rag, um, to the Congress. Many of these rentiers are partly descended from Minan immigrants, but anti-Chinese discrimination is a Philippine tradition. I won't go on about Jose Rizal denying that he had any uh, non-Indio, as he called it, um, ancestry. He did, in fact, Chinese and Spanish, but he one wants to shove that aside. Ferdinand Marcos's Green Revolution led to short stock high yield rice, which did well in some years at Los Banos, but when typhoons and rains come, flooding the short stocks, the farmers are wiped out after having invested big costs. Marcos made rice an unprofitable crop for the tillers. This is a major accomplishment for a nation government. <laughs> Most economists and many political scientists, though not at Berkeley, are allergic to considering, I think, the local political and enterprise motiva motivational factors that can explain either growth or stagnation. My overall conclusion to end, and I'm very close to the end, is that either tigerism or apathy often comes from local leaders' autonomy. Not always, but often. It may seem un-Berkeleyan to credit exploitative small dictators of small and medium enterprises for East Asia's successes. But development is a long story, and actually there is no single route to socioeconomic progress when such improvement does occur. The pattern in China has some similarity with those in Taiwan and Thailand, but neither a path nor a destination is sure in this sort of field. Diversification in economies pluralizes social and political interests. Martin Lipset got that right, surely. And what happens afterward can vary. My main general message is that both economics and political science as disciplines need more realism about local power networks outside the government. Recent successes and failures have emerged for the most part from such networks. That's the general message. I know this is not a Chinese statist way of speaking. That's one of the reasons I'm trying to speak this way, because I think it will, may improve. But it is, it is a way of speaking that is consistent with admiration, which I have, of what the many Chinese polities have achieved nationally, medially, and locally. I can sum up my main China message in terms of partial heresies that I've tried to document here, that leadership and policy are as powerfully local as governmental that the late 1960s were green revolution, not just cultural revolution, not even mainly cultural revolution for most Chinese. That reforms in substance began about 1971, not 1978. That the thoughts, lives, and deaths of top leaders have been generally deemed too important, though I credit Deng Xiaoping for outstanding honesty. He admitted very clearly what he hadn't done, though everybody else credits him for doing it. And that, economi that economists, frankly, should be chastised for having been clueless 
on why China started growing economically when it did so fast. None predicted this. None predicted Taiwan's 1960s plus growth before it happened, or then Thailand's before it happened, or Philippine lack of development. I haven't quoted a World Bank thing that, uh, from the late 50s which predicted the Philippines would be the tiger of the future in East Asia. Uh, and I'm, and I, I'm not saying that this Philippine lack of development will last forever. I, I do think that the current uh, top of the government has a very hard time changing the basic structure of the uh, politics, which is essentially local in the Philippines. None of these predictors took local political factors as seriously causal. Or motivational factors, I avoid the word cultural because it raises so many red flags, but I don't quite see how to avoid it completely. Few sought politics outside the government, especially in networks of entrepreneurs, as very important. Political scientists may become better than economists at explaining the tra trajectories of East Asian countries, zooming in to look at what happens, not just what people repeat to themselves, should help us see more. I want to thank you to, for listening to all this and hope it provides some comments. Thank you. My name is Lan Zhi. Uh, my research has been about uh, urbanized rural areas in China. So um, this is an honor for me to be the discussant of this fascinating uh, talk. Uh, this paper, I'm going to use 10 minutes. <laughs> this paper offers an alternative narrative of China's reforms. It was rural-based, it was bottom-up, and it started much earlier than 1978. Professor White also traces the emergence of rural industries back to the Green Revolution in the 60s. Here, he urges us to re-examine how changes in the agriculture sector can influence the development of the rural economy and of rural society, and that we need to situate China's development within the global context of Green Revolution in the 1960s. Professor Weiss' work also helps to break down the stereotype of the Cultural Revolution as a homogeneous decade and urges us to look into the socioeconomic transformations of the 60s and the 70s in greater detail. To a large extent, this narrative echoes that of Kate Zhou's very famous book, How the Farmers Changed China, Come On, Power of the People. Of course, Zhou is Professor Weiss' student. <laughs> But here, Professor Weiss highlights an important actor in this reform process, the media leaders. These media leaders, local officials, community or grassroots leaders, who have been pragmatic and courageous enough to maintain local autonomy despite political turbulence and thus to nurture local entrepreneurship. This brings us to the discussion of China's administrative hierarchy the varied roles of officials at different levels and the dynamic relations among different levels of governments. Professor White just mentioned he's trying to avoid the term level, although it's hard to avoid. So here, allow me to add a geographer's perspective regarding the question of scale in this analysis. In human geography, the scale question concerns how production is organized at different spatial scales what David Harvey calls hierarchical arrangement, and how scale from the urban, the regional, the national, to the global is produced out of a historical process. Empirically, the majority of literature tends to focus on cities, regions, and the nation states. But I think we should also look downward to see how social and economic activities are organized at lower and smaller scales, at the level of counties, townships, and villages. This is particularly important for China. As China has a very rigid administrative hierarchy, and each level of government has specific administrative duties and economic powers. Therefore, as Professor White has demonstrated, it is important to see how different actors mobilize resources at different scales and how scalar relations and or tensions evolve over time. 
For example, the success of the Green Revolution that Professor White portrays is based on the fact that the communes had by 1960 decentralized their power, scaling down to the production teams. Among the hierarchy of communes, brigades, and production teams, production teams became the de facto landowners and the basic unit of rural production ever since. And this is also why media leaders, most notably cadres of villages and townships, would come to play such an important role in China's reforms. Probably it's also important to recognize the politics of scale in China's reform strategies. For example, the uh, prominent economist St Stephen Zhang, Zhang Wuchang, is a very important uh, scholar in institutional economics. He argues that com the, uh, the competition among counties is a driving force of China's economic growth. This is a, ve a view quite different from mainstream economists. And my recent research noticed a new wave of rescaling. In the Pearl River Delta, cities are trying to demolish village groups in the name of village reforms, Gai. Once this is done, the power structure of Sanji Suoyo, Dui Wei Ji Chu, built and in, and in fact since 1960, will be fundamentally changed. Regarding periodization, Professor White readjusts the starting point of rural industries from the late 70s to the late 60s and the early 70s. The change in periodization certainly will reshape our understanding of China's transformation in various ways. For example, it strikes me that it means rural China has experienced more than 40 years of industrialization. This makes it uh, all the more shocking that institutionally, the urban-rural divide remains rigid. We have become quite familiar with the issue of peasant workers migrating to the cities. But actually, peasants have become non-peasants <laughs> Uh, in many good locales for more than 40 years, especially in Jiangsu, Zhejiang, and Guangdong. But they are still labeled as peasants. Uh, do you remember all the girls that Professor Weiss, you know, working at those factories actually uh, in the 60s or early 70s? This invisible wall has artificially created a dual labor market and a dual citizenship, another kind of hierarchy. The persistence of this dual system is a reminder of how changes of all reforms can occur at a different pace in different sectors, and how some socialist institutions continue to shape China's society and the economy despite massive change at other levels. Finally, comparing China's rural reforms to the lively small and medium prices enterprises in Taiwan and Thailand in the non-growth of the Philippines. Professor White also brings us to a larger discussion about the developmental state. As Professor White emphasizes, local leaders as the driving force of development. The arguments begin uh, kind of reads like there is no developmental state in Thailand and not much of one in Taiwan and China either although many people tend to think that China has an almighty and all-powerful central state. This provocation uh, helps us to rethink that con uh, what actually uh, makes us to rethink what constitutes a developmental state. Or perhaps to ask, are there different forms of developmental state? The typical case of de developmental state, which is Japan, of course, has much to do with the implementation of industrial policies and the building of public-private networks. But how about places that build a pro-market or even less fair environment? Can we call that a developmental state? Or to ask a variation of this question, how can we situate the phenomena of China's local developmentalism in the larger theoretical discussion of developmental state? We should also be aware of the limits to localism, I think. Du Ren-sheng, uh, a very important policymaker in China's re rural reforms, estimates that 30% of production teams had by the early 1960s already adopted the Bao Chan Dao Hu system, uh, which is you know, contracting to households or household responsibility system. 
But this system couldn't be implemented in a widespread manner beyond the local level. Even after reforms had begun a decade later, there were many waves of cracking down of various kinds of local capitalisms in Zhejiang and Fujian throughout the 70s and 80s. So China's reform has been a story of local spontaneous reforms at the bottom, plus the gradual political recognition and institutional support of these changes at the top. To conclude, we need to look at the dynamics of various movements toward decentralization and the recentralization, and analyze the tensions, negotiations, resistances, and the compromises among different levels of governments and the local leaders in flux. Uh, this is it. Thank you. So, uh, invite questions? Professor White to um, respond to the respondent and also to uh, engage in a dialogue with all of us who have been listening to this wonderful I, I lecture. I think I agreed with everything you said, uh, <laughs> which, which was very pleasant. Um, of course, uh, the national government is still there, and, and it, it, does do some, it does do some things. And I have not been dealing with, oh, I have not been, de uh, the, Eleanor is telling me to get close to the uh, microphone. I have not been dealing with some industries, steel and oil being the most obvious, which, uh, which indeed the national government does control and are still planned. Uh, but the vast majority of products are no longer planned. I, I don't think I have any disagreement. I see Kevin back there, and I should say he knows a great deal about some of the topics that I was trying to talk about. Well, I was pleased to hear you talk about the early 70s so much. Uh, when I talk to yeah. my students, I always tell them that five-year period is the most obscure period in yeah, PRC yeah. history. I Absolutely. have to consider whether the 60s are even more obscure. I mean, okay. At least we know about the four cleanups in the early 60s, but the early 70s are, are basically a black hole Got for me. Got to more dissertations on that topic. And I was interested yeah, really, to hear you talk there. about this periodization of 1966 yeah. uh, to 89 uh, as, as one. We hear a lot of people talking about the 1980s as a period and the 90s and beyond, yeah. but rarely do go back to 66 yeah. uh, to 89. Wow. Though, and I'm the last person who wants to defend economists, when I was in graduate school starting in 1979 and 1980, there were a lot of economists writing about the origins of reform being in uh, the 1970s. I think of uh, the work on rural small-scale industry was a right. Carl Riskin. Yes. I think of Christine Wong, maybe in the Perry and Wong book mm -hmm. early Sigurdsson. on. And so yeah. there were a lot of economists talking about this period. So I'm wondering, is your argument different than theirs about the origins of economic reform? And by stretching out to 89, yeah. which hadn't occurred by the time when I was reading these books, does it give a different look to the origins of, of economic reform than those pieces that were being written in the late 80s where these economists already were trying, in the early 80s, where they were trying to tell us 1978 was not as important as you think. Yeah, uh, There were people back then, and there was the five small industries, um, a movement that did have support from some agencies of the central government back then, and there were the economists that you mentioned, Riskin, Sigurdsson, the Icelander, I think the only Icelander uh, in Chinese studies, um, uh, was writing about that. Uh, what can I say? Some of my best friends are economists. But, <laughs> but the, uh, on the whole, they cave to government rhetorics. I was most impressed by that in the mid-80s periods where they began to say that the two-price system, the government, uh, you know, having a state fixed price and having the, uh, I'm sorry, the state fixed price, which was low, and the real prices that were high was brilliant. Well, I, when I took Econ 101, a commodity of standard quality sold at a single time at a single place was supposed to have a unique price. And you got lots of economists at that time uh, saying, uh, no, no, it was all right to have two prices. Why? Because economists love to talk to government leaders and have influence with them. I'm sorry, I hope I'm not offending anybody in this room too much. Um, I'm. Uh, you're right. There were some economists back then writing about this, and there was a, uh, a group of them that put together a report uh, based on a tour of China at that time that was, that was very interesting. And it, uh, what can I say? I wish that that aspect 
of early 1970s scholarship were better remembered now. I should have, I, I think in the paper I may have referred to it. Uh, I didn't cover everything in the long paper that, my, my graduate yes. Right next to me this was all really so oh good, all right. Well, that, that's what I need to do. They talked themselves out of it and they sort of forgot it. I, I'm not sure that fully answers your question. Yes. And the brigade uh, industries, uh, yeah. uh, yes. it's definitely understudied. Yeah. So especially in, you know, in the late 60s and the the early late 70s. 60s and early 70s. And this is definitely you know, uh, probably a field that a lot of PhD students yeah. can, can, can work on. Yeah. I did a lot of the work on this in 1988 at the uh, Shanghai uh, Shuhui Kushui, uh, Kushui Yan. Uh, it was very pleasant to live there in 1988, just before 1989. Uh, because the spirit of the time then was quite free, and one could one could talk to a lot of people about things that had happened uh, before more freely than one can now, actually in China, and uh, material was coming out then, especially in county level gazetteers and uh, in the evening newspapers, the Shanghai Wan Bao, and uh, in other sources like that that were that were very interesting and of course in the statistical yearbooks and in the statistical tables in the gazetteers. I, I, I'm not. Roslyn Che of Temple uh, University. Yeah, thank you for the fascinating um, talk and I especially for those of us who study Chinese political economy, and you know, as you noted in the talk, that a lot of times we begin the reform era in 1978, yep. and um, to kind of have a rethinking of um, of that paradigm, it's it's very fascinating to me. And I think it certainly confirms um, some of the, my studies um, on textiles industry and some of the stuff that I uncovered. Um, you know, showed that some of um, what you're saying about the roots of reform you know, in the very local areas and starting quite early, you know, yeah. in the mid-1960s and, and, and so forth. Um, and even, so... Even early 1960s, as I think my commentator brought up. Pointed quite, out, yeah. Quite accurately, yes. Yeah, so Sorry. very fascinating. Um, and so my question is kind of comes from a more of a comparative um, context and wanting to probe that relationship between economics and, and, and politics. Um, and so you had said that um, land reform in Taiwan had... Um, uh, really unleashed local entrepreneurship and um, and um, and and really unleashed economic yeah. growth in Taiwan yeah. um, and, and to some extent probably paved the way for the economic miracle. Um, so another, I guess, way or, or thinking about that is that um, even as that occurred, it also strengthened KMT um, power and, and political yeah. legitimacy in the post-228 era right. um, in the 50s and the 60s. And so could we extrapolate that experience and think about um, kind of rural um, marketization and reform and what that may mean in China and what, how that may um, perhaps I mean, I guess to get your perspective on, has that strengthened um, CCP um, uh, power or, or kind of um, a, a penetration into the rural areas across the different, the, 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 the huge time period that you're talking about um, from the 60s through, um, through for the late 80s? And so if you have a perspective on that. I think so. This is a really complicated thing. One of my undergraduate students at Princeton was Shelley Rigger. And I just read uh, yesterday, in fact, a chapter that she's written for a book that uh, a group of us, Shelley, Kate, Joe, uh, whom Professor Bo mentioned, and myself, were trying to put together of uh, things written by various various students. And her topic, her question, the question of her paper is, what can or uh, or cannot the mainland learn from Taiwan's political evolution? Uh, I do think that the land reform and also the industrial laws of the mid-50s in Taiwan were very important for raising KMT legitimacy. And I do think, and in fact uh, said, that the prosperity of the small and rural enterprises, destroy planning though they might, have, uh, though they did, uh, raised the legitimacy of the party in China. So there, there are, uh, there are a, a lot of parallels there, I think. What this may mean, I'm not sure exactly what the heart of your question is, but if, if it is, can there be lessons from the Taiwan experience that uh, can be related to the mainland? 
I think the answer to that is really complicated. Taiwan is smaller. That is an advantage in, uh, in many ways. Um, I think the essence of it, and Shelley Rieger thinks that in the thing that isn't published yet, that the essence of it is really the question of whether mainlanders who are interested in reform take the Taiwan experience as interesting and as Chinese. They're willing to take it as Chinese, but are they willing to take it as indicative of something that they might try? Um, that's, just, that's just a tiny aspect of your question. What, what, what was the main... Uh, the the I main thing of it. I just was wondering what your yeah. perspective is. Yeah. Could, we, could we extrapolate that experience? Because one of, um, I mean, in the study of yeah. um, comparative political economy, um, Stephen Haggard and um, Tijun Chang yes. has said that that type of state society relationships really undergirded this, um, the developmental state in, in, in Taiwan. Yes. And so, um, you know, going back to uh, what the, the commentator, um, yeah. um, Professor Bohr, has um, talked about, well, you know, can we, by changing the periodization of um, of the, be the roots of reform in China, we, in a sense, redefine, um, you know, what it means to be a developmental state in Taiwan and, you know, Philippines, Thailand. Um, and does that also then have any lessons for those of us who study the Chinese political economy about state-society relations? You know, obviously, um, the roots of reform, if it began um, in, the er in, in, in the rural areas um, early on, um, and um, you know, it it will it it definitely has impact on state society relations yes, yes. Uh, from you know cent on the center level and and um, how they can reach the Chinese Communist Party's longevity in the in the long run. Yeah. The question: What does this, what is society in the phrase state society and relations? It's not just society, vaguely social. It is political networks. That really is the part, I suppose, of of my spiel. That I'd want to that I'd want to add to this conversation. When the phrase "state society" is used, what it's really talking about is smaller political networks or polities relating to larger ones. Um, now, does do the changes uh, in all of these places um, uh, are there are parallels between Taiwan and the mainland? I think so. Uh, because growth, diversification, I mentioned Seymour Martin Lipset in the uh, thing, uh, certainly diversifies the kinds of interests in local polities and therefore affects the larger, the, the larger policy, polity. And the way in which that, the, those relationships are managed, both by local leaders and by national leaders uh, varies from place to place. I suppose what I would do mainly in answer to that would be to question the word society. Because when people use the word society in that way, I think they're really referring to something that's very political. So Hi. Michelle Mack, a <laughs> former student from, uh, from Princeton. There you go. I wore and the orange and black on yes, purpose. Yes, she's wearing <laughs> orange and black. I hope other people appreciate this. But I have something for you that also is blue and gold. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. uh, Just from a very simple point of view uh, on my part, you know, I think of the phrase, Tian Gao Huang Di Yuan. You know, the sky is high, yeah. the emperor is far away. And I think, yeah. in some ways, how did everyone miss this? You know, yeah. looking up here, not on this, this level. Um, at the same time, um, it makes me think of w when I think of Deng Xiaoping being either humble or candid and saying, mm -hmm. oh, I was surprised by this, a very yep. honest response. Yeah. So it makes me wonder sometimes how much do the leaders at the top or people on the provincial level at least know what's going on, but they allow it, sort of like Professor Bo was saying, yeah. they could have some crack crackdowns here and there on these small yeah. and medium enterprises. It makes me think of the work that I do now that you're familiar with, uh -huh. where when you're looking at crackdowns on Falun Gong or crackdowns yeah. on the spiritual movements of Christianity and that sort of thing, you know, the government clearly knows there's millions of people who are Christians and they'll come crack yeah. down here, there, you know, and, you know, 
what do they say? Kill the monkey to scare the chicken, or yes. kill the chicken yeah. to scare the monkeys, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So like I get mixed up between my animals, right? <laughs> but yeah. then I think of why they've really been so uh, forceful in their eradication of the Falun Gong, because if you think about that, they ding wei xie jiao. Mm -hmm. They've they've said that this they've um, designated it as mm -hmm. a political. The cult, a, a cult, but also said that they're a, a, zheng zhe dang, a mm. political party. Yeah. So in some ways, they, they've been more uh, vicious, shall we say, or violent or, or um, aggressive in their attempts to squash that. Yeah. So recognizing that as political, as opposed to just letting the people sort of have a little ebb and flow or do their own thing, as long as we've controlled, you know, there's, it's, they've still, it's not so I, luan, you know? Yeah. I, li I use the phrase uh, control freaky oh, to, okay. uh, to describe the Chinese government. I admire the Chinese government in many ways. But it does have a sense of paranoia. And I believe, frankly, that there are bureaucracies that depend on a sense of paranoia. My wife and I have just come from Tibet we were leading a group of Princeton alums, and you can't get an individual visa into Tibet, but you can get a um, group visa, and this, so we went in this group to Tibet. And we flew straight from Lhasa to Shanghai. From night to day, in terms of freedom, there is a tremendous amount of control of some things in China. Separatism, or feared separatism, although actually Tibet's not about to separate no country recognizes its independence, uh, it, fear of Falun Gong or Tibetan or Uyghur separatism uh, or really anything that the government doesn't know about in advance is very, very, uh, is very, very strong. The Chinese government has a tradition of supporting the idea that China may collapse, really. Uh, and the bureaucracies depend, uh, uh, many careers depend really on maintaining uh, a tremendous emphasis on, on fear that national security is a big problem. To some extent, I stand back from this and look at it. China is the most populous country on the state of the earth. It is a nuclear power. Uh, none of the, uh, except Taiwan, which eventually I think will, uh, will I don't know whether Rosie or others may agree or disagree with this. I, eventually, I think it will become part of China. Uh, and the United States is indeed protecting the liberal system on Taiwan, but not Taiwan independence. Um, except for Taiwan, uh, the uh, geographical integrity of China is, is very clear. The amount spent, though, on public security uh, is, is huge. And the variation within China by place and to some extent by, on other dimensions, is absolutely immense. The contrast between Lhasa and Shanghai was, was just amazing, for example. Um, they're very worried about the Falun Gong. Well, they've, made, they've managed to make enemies of the Falun Gong, of various other churches, far more than they needed to. The Chinese government is very adept, uh, as many governments are actually, at shooting themselves in the foot. Uh, eventually, I think, uh, they will relax and realize how strong they are. Uh, nationalism and economic development are very strong in China, and the government's legitimacy is very strong and has been sustained by the economic progress. Uh, I don't think that even if the economic progress slows down somewhat, as it is probably will do to some extent, um, that the, the uh, government will be basically threatened. The change may come because of disagreements between groups that I've been calling conservatives and reformers using essentially a parade and circulation of elites kind of analysis within the Chinese Communist Party. And eventually, I think the reformers will be able to adapt the party better to the fast-changing situation in which it finds itself and uh, that it will be able to retain its, uh, uh, its rule. Thank you. I didn't mean to oversimplify. <laughs> no. <laughs> the, on the other no, also. I, the, 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 I'm an <laughs> academic. I just oversimplified it even more than you did. Yeah. Okay. And if nobody has another question.
question. I just wanted to comment. This morning on NPR, they were talking about a, an America, a historian who tried to change a footnote in history about American history yes, and couldn't that. get past the people on Wikipedia. So yeah. I'm just hoping that um, with, uh, I think, your publications and I, the things you're asking to the economists and the political political scientists to actually look at this, I hope you have more success than getting past the uh, censors at Wikipedia, well, so that the yeah. general public will benefit from your scholarship. I heard that in your presentation, actually, it was very interesting. Uh, I, I have a couple questions, which I think yeah. actually have to do with... But somebody has to ask a hard one. Right. Well, well, no, I don't so know if these are hard really. ones, but <laughs> in, in some sense, they're just a request for more yeah. detail, because okay. I, I was so fascinated by this account yeah. of the Cultural Revolution yeah. also being part of, or, or, or maybe exceeding in your account, to, to the Green Revolution. Um, and, and I think that's a really, really fascinating move, because it also places... China's rural development, or China's development yeah. in general, in a much larger global context in which yeah. it suddenly becomes possible to talk about some very interesting comparisons with places like Brazil or, or, or Africa uh -huh. or uh, other parts of Southeast Asia, as yeah. you've done in your yeah. paper. Um, but one request for further nuance about that story is, is um, if indeed, for instance, new kinds of rice cultivars or varieties are being introduced yeah. that require new kinds of mechanization, that require new kinds of machines yeah. to be produced or manufactured on a local level. I'm curious actually where that kind of technological information is coming from. Is that part of the uh, development, de yeah. developmental state that's introducing oh. those cultivars yeah. or is it a local initiative? Um, yeah. Is the rudimentary but still yeah. important manufacturing pen. capability Yes. Coming from state institutes, or is it coming yeah. from local cadres who are going out and grabbing that information from somewhere? Which leads me to the second part of the question, which is if, if these local uh, small and medium state enter uh, enterprises on a rural level in the late 60s and early 70s, they're essentially creating a new market, right, along yeah. with new products. And as I understand from your account, the, lo the market is largely local on a county level or a kind of regional, provincial level. But markets, of course, have to do with goods being produced and consumed, but also with information circulating in new ways, right? So that the people who are producing pumps have to understand what their market is, and, and the people throughout, say, Jiangsu, need to understand that they can buy these pumps and what these pumps can do for them. So yeah. I'm kind of curious about the expansion of media uh, or the circulation yeah. of information in this period and whether it's changing or whether there are new ways that local leaders are able to communicate with each other yes. as they bypass state information networks, which, of course, we know are very powerful during the Cultural Revolution and also, at least in the typical calendar, very univocal, right? There's you know, loudspeaker systems and, and, and state media that dominate all dispersal of, of right. information. So I'm wondering if information systems are also changing along with um, um, the kind of local economic uh, systems. Yes, they are in spades. Let me, ask, let me start with that second part of, of your question. The new markets um, did begin as oh, quite local, but what was really those had been going on for a long time. Um, the, uh, the, I'm glad that you mentioned the wired information of the loudspeakers. It used to be, I don't know whether there are others, I'm sure Phil Parrish and, and Kevin O'Brien know about this, but uh, there used to be very extensive wired network systems at which, uh, in which uh, the cadres of any rural area uh, would get on the uh, horn, so to speak, and uh, tell their oh, all the villagers uh, what to do, um, and also uh, uh, read editorials from new, from national newspapers and that sort of thing. Um, but also convey a lot of local information. This wasn't all national. As a matter of fact, China has a the, ever since Qin Shi Huangdi, the the uh, great unifier of China, the first really important one, um, there has been an ideology that everything should be centralized. And that ideology is still very strong 
in many parts of China. But in fact, these networks uh, were, uh, were also local. And they strengthened, they strengthened localism just as much as they strengthened uh, any uh, centralization. Since then, advertising has become much more important in media. And advertising, because it's always seeking larger markets, tends to be more national, actually, than the previous systems in the Maoist period, although one thinks of the Cultural Revolution as being a, a period of extreme centralization. Actually, it wasn't. Um, that doesn't complete the answer your question, but I think it's a part of it. Uh, you asked whether cultivars, where they came from, the, the new rice seeds. The answer is a lot of them came uh, from provincial research institutes. Um, of course, there was national research going on too, but it's very hard to get rice to grow well. Um, and one can make big mistakes. I mentioned uh, the Philippine case, the, what is it called? Um, uh, Masagana or something like that, uh, re reform in the Philippines, uh, where Ferdinand Marcos uh, was impressed by the Los Baños rice seeds that had been produced with support from a various American foundations, I think especially Ford, um, at Los Baños in Laguna province. Uh, and he said, wonderful, this is short stock rice, produces a lot, everybody ought to plant this. And they subsidized the uh, growing of this. Trouble was any cultivar of that sort really has to be adapted to the area in which it grows. That was really good for areas just like Los Baños in good years. It was not resistant to a lot of rain. Um, it, in, or for that matter, drought. It was rather, uh, it had to be a narrow and, uh, range. The Philippines gets big typhoons and uh, rainstorms. And uh, what happened was in most years, indeed, those rice seeds would produce more in that area, uh, in the areas of the Philippines that were appropriate um, for that seed. But in some years, the crop would be totally wiped out. What this meant was that the tillers of the, of the land uh, tended to go into debt because they had uh, over a series of years. Because even though they would make more in most years, in some years they would be completely wiped out. And their creditors were, of course, their patrons. And there's a phrase in Tagalog, utang na lob. I hope there's nobody who speaks Tagalog here because mine is not fluent. But it means unrepayable debt. And there was a growth of unrepayable debts. The effect, the political effect, of Marcos's land reform was to increase the power of patrons over clients. And also actually to get the patrons more out, really out of the business of agriculture and more into the business of just managing debt and collecting. Uh, I mean, they, they didn't, they, they pulled further away. The, in China, the cultivars mainly came from provincial research institutes and they couldn't just automatically use Los Baños rice or rice from India or Nigeria or other places that were all doing research on this. They had to have cultivars that were appropriate to the place where the rice was planted and to the long-term climatic conditions, not just one year, but series of years on average, uh, you know, where, they, where it would work. It's tricky business. And, um, but the, from provincial research institutes <laughs> is the main answer to that question. That's another scale. That's fairly high. Provincial research institutes is quite a high level, but it isn't the national level, and it isn't the very local level. China is so big, there are all these levels. Have I exhausted people? I may have done. There is a presidential debate coming up, and uh, I think I was less nervous than Barack Obama and uh, Mitt Romney probably are uh, giving their thing. OK, I, I want to talk I informally with everybody in this room uh, on uh, various occasions and have much more uh, informal contact now, especially now that we're moving to Berkeley, with everybody in the Center for Chinese Studies, not just this year, but over a series of winters when we'll be here. So thank you very much. So, thank you. Okay.